Well, good morning, everyone. So hopefully you got an outline coming in today, uh, some fill in the blanks. Also, too, there's uh, some upcoming events and whatnot on the back of that if you want to find out what's going on. So um, we're, we're going to uh, continue in our series. Also, too, before I get going, um, so not next week, but the following week, or not this week, the following week, uh, we'll have Vacation Bible School. And so do be in prayer for that. It's a great week, and it's also a long week for, for staff and those who are volunteering. <clears throat> we got a ton of kids coming, and so that's always exciting to to have, a, uh, have that uh, take place, so be in prayer for that. And then also at the end of the service, if I fail to mention, if you're interested in prayer in room 201, which is across from the coffee area, uh, you can uh, go there and some folks will be happy to pray with you, all right? So here are uh, kind of some statistics. We're in the series called Dating, Marriage, and Life through the summer, probably maybe another four, another six, six weeks or so, um, just as we kind of navigate through summer. Taking some things that people have asked, uh, we'll look in a couple weeks about dating, had some questions about what does dating look like. Uh, of course, we have a message for Father's Day, um, so we'll have different blended family messages as well, uh, talking about blended families and how that looks. So uh, here's some statistics, not just, just for something to j just grab a hold of. Um, there is a thing that's called um, a seven-year itch, if you've ever heard that, that marriages have a seven-year itch. That actually is a true statement that actually does happen. And typically um, in the eighth year, uh, you'll find that there is an uptick in areas of divorce. Um, <clears throat> about 75% of all divorces will remarry, right? And so I say that because oftentimes when somebody goes through a divorce, it's like, I'm never going to get remarried. It's like, <clears throat> statistically, you are. Uh, you know, back when I first started in the ministry, right when the uh, Noah's Ark landed and the bird flew out and found some land and they came back and then I got called into the ministry. Um, it used to be that people, when they were in their 70s, they, it's like done, time out, we're over with. So it's not uncommon now to see marriages in the, late, in the 80s, even in the mid 80s. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing. And you guys all said, wow, for that. So that's good. Thank you. Um, also, um, that uh, divorce, according to a 50-year study, 50 years, that's a long time, 50-year study found that um, divorce is actually bad for your health. It actually shortens your life by, by four years, which is kind of interesting. Had no idea I found that. And then the other thing is, is that, um, and I think this statistic is a little old, but that, uh, that over a million children in America are affected by divorce and roughly 40%, actually I think it's above 50% now, um, of 50% of children are all affected by divorce. So when you look at 100 kids, 50 plus of those children have a parent or parents who have gone through divorce, right? Not, not saying anything, just, just laying out the statistics in the world in which uh, we live in and the world in which uh, I pastor a church in, right? So today we're going to talk about some lies that um, can cause some destruction in marriage. So be careful. Uh, the title is Be Careful for Lies That Destroy Your Marriage. So let me, let me just kind of back up and, and cover, get you guys situated here, all right? <clears throat> so as you go through life, so if you're married, if you're dating, if you're going to get married some down t day down the road, if you have friends that are struggling in marriages, this is all good stuff, all right? So as you walk through life, you collect things, all right? And I'm not talking about trinkets in your garage, but I'm talking about behaviors that you collect. So <clears throat> as you walk through life, you learn from good, bad, or indifferent from your parents what marriage looks like, right? From your in-laws, if you're married, what marriage looks like. From your grandparents, from a friend, from a coworker, from, you know, whoever. And so as you walk through life, you're picking up these traits. Now, some of these traits are wonderful, some of them not so much, and some of them are lies. Now, you don't know that they're a lie because if you knew they were a lie, you wouldn't be doing them. So you think that they're true, and so you begin to make decisions around these lies that you believe, right? And it doesn't mean that someone gave them lies to you out of a sense of evilness, but you're just walking through life, and, and you know, you have it, and you think, hey, this is a truth that we have, and I'm going to build my marriage <clears throat> around these ideas. And we're going to talk about four of them that, that I see constantly in, in, in marriages and whatnot. And so I've changed the name to protect the guilty. Just kidding. 
So uh, I'm not going to say any names or anything, but, but, these, but these are true. So here's the picture I want to give you, okay? <clears throat> if you are going to make a wooden structure or a sewing thing or whatever, whatever you're going to make, and you needed, pick a number, 15 one-foot whatever it is that you're going to make, okay? And so you ask Pastor Dan, you say, hey, Pastor Dan, I know you're, you're kind of challenged with, with letters, but you probably can get the numbers right. I need a one-foot widget, right, and I need you to cut it so that when I start doing my project, I'm going to put it down, and I'm going to use it as kind of a grid, and I'm going to put it down, I'm going to cut it, I'm going to put it down, I'm going to cut it, I'm going to put it down, I'm going to cut it, right? And i got to make whatever, 40, 50, whatever, whatever it is, okay? And so you give the task to Pastor Dan, and Pastor Dan is... I'm, I'm challenged, right, in a lot of ways. And all the church said, amen to that, right? <clears throat> so I cut it 11 inches. You don't know that, right? And so you begin to build your project 11 inches, 11 inches, 11 inches. Now, you think it's 12. And so at the end of your cutting of the stuff, you begin to assemble it. It's not working. And you're like, well, what? why isn't it working? So you get a tape measure, and you pull out the tape measure, and you go, oh, the guy's dyslexic, he's not very smart, and he can't even tell the difference between 1-1 one, one and 1-2 one, on a tape measure, right? But you have built your whole project around something that is, in this case, it's not an evil lie, it's just a lie. It's not 12 inches. So in marriage, it's the same thing. As we walk through life, we collect these things. And we think, hey, this is true, and so I'm going to build my marriage around whatever it is. And so I want to walk you through a couple of them, four of them, that, that I oftentimes see. And I want to kind of uh, kind of give you a picture of some of the solutions that's involved in it. Now, we're going to have a little fun, because whenever we do a message on this, we got to laugh to keep from crying. Is there an amen to that? So you, you guys need to participate. If you're not laughing, um, it gets kind of awkward, okay? And I'll, and I'll call that out at that time that it goes on. So John chapter 8, here's what Jesus says uh, of, of Satan, okay? And all lies come from him, right? Even if it's not an evil intent, it's still misinformation, right? It's still a lie. And so he says, the devil <clears throat> was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for, uh, for he is a liar and the father of lies, all right? <clears throat> and so remember that Je Jesus says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light, right? So he only needs a small percentage of error in order for that to happen. A little yeast spoils the whole batch. Yeast is a picture of sin. And, and so when we have that little bit of yeast in our life, even if it's like an innocent, we didn't know, we just picked it up from our parents, it still has a de devastating uh, effect on the relationship. And then a few verses earlier in John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus says this, when you know the truth, what will the truth do? The truth will set you free, right? And so the goal is, is to try to figure out what lies that perhaps we're building our relationship on, or maybe a loved one is building their relationship on, that, that we can kind of help them or we can navigate it in our own life, all right? So let's take a look. Four lives that destroy marriages. And <clears throat> so number one, in your outline, the first one is that I can change him slash her, okay? Is there a hallelujah yet in the house? <clears throat> so here's what it looks like. So Pastor Dan is standing up here, and he's going to officiate the service, and we have two beautiful people coming in, all dressed up to the nines. And by the way, they are madly in love, and this thing's going to work forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? And so all of a sudden, they come up here, and we go through our little drill, and we talk about whatever, and da, 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 da. And I say, you know, do you? Yes, I do, I do, I do. And then they leave, and they instantly begin to think about redoing not the vows, each other. They're going to make changes. So there's a saying that says this, that man, a man, men marry woman, uh, marries a woman in hopes that they, they won't change. A woman marries a man hoping they will change. Both of them are disappointed. Is there an amen to that? All right. 
So here's the way it works. So let's have a little fun so we have a little bit of laughter in the house, okay? <clears throat> so when you become attracted to a person and, you know, you're interested in that person, it's always by looks. You look at them and they're a hottie, she's good looking, he's hot, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So, I mean, every time I come home, that's what my wife does. She says that all the time. <laughs> it's, it's terrible. I noticed that she left, so I'm going to play on it. And I tell her, honey, I have feelings, right? I have feelings. You need to speak into my heart, not I'm a piece of meat. <laughs> Just joking, all right? And if any of you sn snitch on me, you're out of the church. That's it. You're no longer worthy of hanging out with a screwed up pastor, okay? So, so we're, we, we look at a distance, we're like, whoo. She's a hottie, he's a hottie, right? And, and so we're instantly, that's how we're drawn, right? And, and so then from there, from that instant kind of, you know, look of what they look like and, you know, whatever you're, you're interested in them, <clears throat> then what the second step is, which is interesting, is it's the differences that you are attracted to. And so opposites attract and then they attack, Okay? So all of a sudden, you look at the person, they're a hottie, they're good looking, they're wonderful, right? And then you get to know them, and there are some things about them that is different. It's different from you. And, and you're intrigued with that. You're like, hmm, it's different. I, 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 I kind of like that, right? So, so, so in, you, you, doesn't, this isn't stereotyping. This could be either way, male or female. But, but let's say the woman finds a guy, right? He's a hottie, he's good looking, right? He's smart, he's easygoing, right? And, and, and he's just like, he's a chill monster, right? Everything's just chilling. He's like a lazy river at a water resort. You know what I'm saying? He's not, he's not whitewater rafting. It's like you sit on the inner tube and you just kind of go around. And whenever you go around, we don't know how long it takes. It's all good, everything's good, right? And then all of a sudden you come in here and it's like, I do, I do, let's redo and you leave. And then, and then you get home and here's what it looks like, right? You're like, Ex excuse me, could I show you the hamper? <laughs> could, could, you, could you just, chill monster, could you just put your underwear in the hamper? Do, do they have to just like come off right there? <laughs> Let me show you. The hamper's that little wicker thing in the room, in there, and you could just, you could, listen, you could pick it up with your toes, and you could do one of these things, and you could walk right over, and you could drop it in the hamper, because, because at night, we don't have a laundry fairy that floats through the house and picks up everything, right? It's like, ah, what, what difference? If it gets washed this week, next week, next month. Well, what if friends come over? Who cares? Everything's good. It's all easy, right? They're, they're just cruising through, right? So then later in the marriage, it's like the guy isn't motivated to pick up his underwear. What am I going to do with that? We got to redo it. We got to somehow figure out a change. So let's do a guy. He meets a hot chick. She's good looking, right? She's confident. She's an independent woman, right? I mean, listen, when she takes her car to the garage, she's got the manual, right? S some dude ain't going to snicker her on a $70 air filter. <clears throat> she knows they're 12 bucks. You're not going to do that to me. Listen, Mr. Mechanic Man, let me just tell you, the way that it is, right? You, you're, you're not going to pull one over on me. I am confident, independent woman. Woman power. Fine. So then as time goes on, that type of personality becomes one where all of a sudden the man feels alienated. And by the way, you can switch the, the, the genders. It doesn't matter. All of a sudden it's like, excuse me, why did we get remarried? Why did we get married? Right? Why, why isn't it? Why? Well, I, I really don't, I didn't really need you. <clears throat> I just have you. 
well, can we like do life together? I'm a confident woman. I don't need that. My mom told me this is the way it is, right? And all of a sudden, that confidence becomes a driving wedge between why are we even married? Why are we even doing this thing, right? So it's like, I don't know if you've ever had this when you're hiking and you get a little piece of dirt or sand in your shoe, and maybe you're as smart as I am, you think that you could wiggle your toes as you're walking to somehow figure out how to get that rock in between your toes so that it's not hurting your foot, you know, because it's too hard to stop and take off your shoe, right? And so you, you hike, you know, a block and a half, <clears throat> and you take off your shoe, and all of a sudden you got a red mark on the bottom of your sock. That little pebble has now created a sore on the bottom of your foot. And in marriages, it's the same way. All of a sudden, it's like, she's hot, he's hot. There's a difference. It's like, hmm. And then all of a sudden, it begins to grind over time. I've, I've watched this with remarriages where a woman <clears throat> has custody of a kids. And th th by the way, all these things are real life stories. It happened multiple times. This isn't like a one-off thing. And, and he, you know, he, a guy, he has a marriage uh, uh, it, it ends in a divorce. He has custody of his kids. He's a sports coach, right? And he meets the new honey at the soccer field or baseball field, whatever it was, right? And she is admiring him because he is spending all of his time with his kids. And I wish that deadbeat dude that I had before just would spend five minutes with my kids. He is a great dad. And guess what happens when they get married? His loyalty doesn't change. His loyalty is still to his kids. And the wife is like, why did we even meet? Right? What, what, where, what are we even doing? Right? Th this is true with ladies that are in their early 20s into their 30s. So they meet a guy. And he's, you know, hot, good looking, all that stuff. And, you know, he's a little, he's kind of a party animal. He smashes beer cans on his forehead. He gets on the table, lifts up his shirt. He's a fool, okay? And so he's all like that. And the woman's like, oh, this is kind of fun. This is kind of in interesting. It's all great. And, and so he decides, right, they get married. And he decides he's got a brilliant idea. He's going to invite 75 of his drunk buddies over the house just for a weekend to have a little fun. Little pool, little darts, little pool games, you know, the whole nine yard. We're going to smash beer cans on our head. It's going to be awesome. Well, the wife has graduated from that. And now she's in what we call nesting, which is now she's thinking about her future. She's thinking about children, right? He's like, hey, honey, this is great. I got all my drunk buddies from college. We're going to come. I got the pool, uh, the pool machine outside, the pool, pool game out, the darts, the horseshoes. We're going to, listen, we're going to throw the lawn darts from the old days where there's spikes, and we're going to throw them, and we're going to see if we can have a little fun, and it's going to be awesome. And the wife's like, I thought we were going to go down and look at bassinets. And what color to paint the room? And he's like, well, after we smash the beer cans on our head, right, and the cops come and take all my buddies away, we're going to do that. So he's like, when, when can we do that? And she's like, when? Never. Right? So then what she ends up doing and what we do when we want change, because we know that there's a biblical principle in it, and that is we begin to criticize because criticizing changes a person. In fact, there's a Bible verse about that, isn't there? No, there isn't. In fact, Proverbs 21 says, it's better to be on the corner of your roof than to be with a nagging, it's wife, but you can, you can interchange them, right? Some of you are looking for a place on your roof to hang out, right? Because of this. So, so you've heard me say this before when I've done marriage stuff. So a healthy marriage looks like this, straight line. An unhealthy marriage looks like this, high highs and low lows. Healthy marriage is, it's the same. Doesn't mean that there's no spontaneity. 
doesn't need there, there's no romance doesn't mean any of that stuff but it is a it is a straight line of sameness so what causes the dysfunction is we criticize for change we want change and so what happens is we we think well i need to change her i need to change him and so i'm going to criticize so i've said it he didn't hear it i said it she didn't hear it so i gotta turn up the volume and i gotta up the ante, ante and i call it throwing bombs right and the bombs have to be bigger in order to get their attention and so what happens is they get their attention and they make changes for a minute it's not long-term change and so as soon as they revert back to their old ways guess what we're thinking well last time i went ballistic he changed she changed guess what i need to do now i got to go super ballistic in order to do this and so when you find in your relationship where everyone is up in the ante in the argument that's the reason why you're wanting change you're not getting change and so you're turning up the volume to get change okay so let me give you a couple suggestions um, to, to, to write down so in, in your outline when your marriage isn't going the way that you want it to go first one in your outline fill in the blank blank is how about this why don't you pray to God to change them right Rem remember what James says James says you have not because you ask not so oftentimes we don't get the change that's necessary because we're not even asking God to do it and so in in James chapter uh, 5 verse 16 he, he says this he says the prayer of a righteous person not a proud for proud uh, proudful person but a righteous person a purchase person is is powerful and effective right so we want to spiritually position ourselves where we're not prideful but where we're righteous and you could jot down on the side luke chapter 18 which talks about the persistent widow who keeps going back to the judge for change right it's a picture of prayer that we need to continue to pray and cont continue to seek god in that second one in your outline is prayer may or may not change your spouse but it always changes you right it always changes you in your in your life <clears throat> and so th th this is where um where you can't can you can't change them you already tried it didn't work right so just give up on that but god can change a heart and, and so we're going to begin to pray that god's going to change them god's going to change us as well and then i'm going to reinforce it here in your outline so you're going to pray that god would change you right that you that, that god would change you i know and and the pushback is is like well pastor dan i don't need to change it's always them and it's like i know i know i know so the reality is that there's always truth in both sides of, of a person's story okay and then the th the then the uh the fourth one in your outline is if you want a better marriage start by making a better you right again you can't change yourself but you can change you and the direction you need and psalms 139 and this isn't just for marriage this is really any time that you're criticized right this is a great verse to just self-reflect on and and it says in psalm 139 verse 23 it says search me god and know my heart see if there are any offensive uh, offensives in my way and lead me in the way of everlasting and it's just a way that we ask god for the holy spirit to reveal to us any changes that, that need to take place and when we seek god not to change them because we really want to focus on our heart but god oftentimes begins to change our attitude right where, where maybe we're, we're criticizing and we realize hey this isn't working i i got to pray and ask god to change his heart maybe we become confident in the sense that we're not allowing someone to continue to abuse us and we're going to have healthy boundaries in our life so that, that god can bring uh, healing in the relationship oftentimes prayer will bring healing in our own life and it will give us the power to forgive ourselves in many cases sometimes it's the power to forgive other people and so we want to make sure that that we're our heart is right in that area so the first lie is you cannot change a person right so don't even think that you can change them second one in your outline the second one is that a good marriage is always 50 50 and i don't know if you've ever heard that i call it a tit for tat kind of relationship 
And, and that is where people will say, you know, I do this because they do that, and I don't do this because they don't do that, right? I Any time in a relationship, and specifically in a marriage, where you're keeping score, you have one of two options that's going to happen. You'll either be miserably married for however long that marriage lasts, until death do us part, or you'll divorce. But you're not going to have a healthy marriage if you see this as a scorekeeping formula where we go back and forth, okay? So, so in your outline is a little formula that we put in there, and it says a half-hearted effort plus a half-hearted commitment equals a wholehearted disappointment. And so when we're living that way and we're keeping score, then we know that we're going to end up losing in, in the end in the relationship, okay? And so relationships oftentimes will get into this. It's like, well, I'm not going to do that because he's doing that or because she's doing that. At some point, to be very candid with you and honest, somebody has to put on their, their adult pants and they have to step over the line and say, I'm going to do this because the scripture teaches that there is a full submission, what, we, what I call dual submission. So dual submission is the wife submits to the husband and the husband submits to the wife 100%. Not 50, but 100%. Right? And so when you have this dual submission, then you have a desire that you're going to meet your spouse's needs. And their desire is they're going to meet your needs. And as a result, both needs are met. Right? And, and so I'm going to use air quotes. So we have the religious guys, and we love you for that, but the religious guys will say this to Pastor Dan. You, typically it's privately, <laughs> privately, but they'll say this. Pastor Dan, the Bible says that I am the spiritual leader of the house. And so I need to make sure that I have that authority in which I say, you're right. The Bible says you, you are. You are the spiritual leader of your house. High five for thinking about that. Now let's, let's break it down a little bit. Jesus was the spiritual leader of the church. And you remember what he did? He died for it. And so when you're willing to die for your family, then you understand what spiritual leadership looks like. Because what, what they're saying with this veil of kind of spirituality is that I'm the leader, therefore I'm going to get what I want. Well, that isn't the way the scripture, it says that Jesus forsook all of his desires in order to die on a cross for you and I. That is the picture, specifically to guys, that is the picture of how we are to love our wife. So, so then the pushback is, is well, well, Pastor Dan, I would die for my wife. I mean, if someone came in and they kicked the door in and I heard the alarm and some bad guy ran in, I mean, I would be willing to lay my life down and take the bullet from the bad guy. I'm like, great. The problem is, is how often does that happen? Never. But what happens is, Tuesday, you had a long day. You had a long commute. And you come home and your wife had a really bad day. And the kids were off the hook. And that is when you die to self. That's what it means. That you're willing to put away your wishes and your wants and your desires and your whatevers in order to meet her needs and the needs of the kids. That's what it means to die to self. Not that some bad guy's kicking the door in. That's a no-brainer, right? Of course you're going to do that. You're not going to run. So when, when I was growing up, my parents weren't believers until later in life uh, after I, Tammy and I came to Christ. And my dad had this, tr this, this quality in his life and we had the five boys, and he worked for the government. He worked at the shipyard, didn't make a ton of money. And so when, when we needed baseball cleats and bit mitts and, and basketball shoes and all that other stuff, I would watch my dad forego his desires, in many cases boots that had holes in them, to go to work in order for him to buy us batting gloves and baseball gl cleats and different things like that for sports, right? So, so being totally transparent with you, I grew up with that mindset. Right? This wasn't even, in, in my growing up, it wasn't even a biblical thing. This was just like a thing that guys do. 
right? And then later in the ministry, I, I began to do some counseling, got exposed to some stuff. And all of a sudden, I started hearing something that's completely different. It's like, I'm the spiritual leader. I bring home the bacon. If I want it, I'm going to go get it. And, and I was like, I, I, don't, I don't get that. That dog never hunted in my house, and it certainly doesn't hunt in my life currently as a believer. But that's not what a spiritual leader is. A spiritual leader doesn't seek his own advantage. A spiritual leader seeks the advantage of someone else to benefit before it's their turn to do it. And, and, and you would get the guys, and again, not to beat up on the guys today. It's not Father's Day. I'll do that on Father's Day. But, but the guys are like, <laughs> you know, and they're kind of talking under their breath. They're like, excuse me, I need a translator on aisle four, please. Right? It's like, what, what, what is that? <laughs> you know, scratch himself in funny places. <laughs> right? It's like, I, I don't get it. Right? So, so here, here's what I learned, and, and I don't need an amen from anybody in the house, but if you're a guy today, and, and, and you're like, man, I just wish my wife would meet my needs, I'm going to be very candid with you. Die for her and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, then come back to me and tell me that that principle isn't, tr isn't true. But, but, but my experience with thousands of hours of counseling is that when you get into that tit-for-tat thing, then both people fold their arms and don't move forward with it. And yet great marriages don't happen by accident, they happen on purpose. And so when we have this dual submission, it's who can outserve who, when we have the 50-50 split, then it becomes a business transaction. If you do, I'll do, and if you don't, I won't, right? And, and there, it is not a winner winner chicken dinner in, in that type of situation, right? So here's a couple questions for you. So two questions for you, I think are pretty powerful. The first one in your outline is, what would, uh, what would happen if both of you gave 100%? What would happen, right? And, and in many cases, it's way better than what you're currently doing, okay? And then the second question is this, what would happen if you don't? And I can tell you, I know, you'll be miserably married for the rest of your life if that's what you choose to do, or you'll divorce. That's the only options. If you're not willing to change, that's your only options. Are you with me? Number three. The third thing is this. <clears throat> um, this. This little thing isn't a big thing. Okay? This little thing isn't a big thing. So through my years in, in the ministry, I've had the privilege of of, um, and, the, and, and the honor of kind of walking guys who've ha been in the ministry, have had moral failures, kind of walking them through re reconstructing what, you know, what took place and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and then in, in church, people who've had, had those, uh, had affairs and whatnot. And, and I, it's a lot of good information for me because it helps me to kind of understand and process uh, for boundaries and, and, and guardrails and stuff in our life. But, but what ends up happening is oftentimes in life, you hear about the big thing, you know, he was unfaithful, she lived a double life, right? It's the big thing. And so everyone thinks that it's all about the big thing. Well, the problem is, is the big thing didn't happen by the big thing. The big thing happened because there were a lot of little things that went unchecked, unconfessed, and it continued. And then as sin, sin grows in the darkness, and it multiplies, and it gets, you, it gets larger. It's yeast, right? It just grows. And, and so what oftentimes people will say is, well, this isn't really that big of a deal. And besides, I'll keep it under covers. No one will know. So there's a proverb that says that your sins will not go undisclosed, Right? I've seen that happen in ways that are actually miraculous. And so God is going to expose for the protection of the other person. And he's going to bring light to, light to it. And so when you begin to live your life and you think, oh, it's no big deal. It's just going to go, you know, it's not that big of a deal. And, and, and we just kind of push it away. It, it, it's going to grow. So if you take like a person who's had an affair, all right, they're not at the grocery store one day in the cereal aisle, 
and look over and there's a hot chick or a hot dude. And they look over and go, hey, Lucky Charms, hey, you want to get lucky tonight? You want to go to a hotel room? <laughs> Doesn't happen, right? It, it's, that's not the way it works. But what works is, is that they begin to think, you know what? My needs aren't being met. You, you know what? He's not, you know, she's not, right? And, and, and then you start thinking, oh, but you know when I talk to him and when I talk to her, man, it's so wonderful. I mean, I just feel so close. It's so... I just have like this emotional connection to it, right? That was a conversation, could be totally appropriate. But all of a sudden, it's these little things, it's these little things, it's these little things that lead to the big explosion. So in our spiritual journey, we're not to manage our sin. We are to confess it. Right? And, and so confession isn't, Lord, forgive me today for this. I'm going to do it tomorrow. But, Lord, forgive me for now so I feel good about myself. That's just playing a game with God. Con confession means to turn from it, to flee from it, to go in a, to, to go in a, a, complete different, a, a complete different direction. So when we have these little secrets, it can be something like this. Again, th these are all true stories. It's like, you know what? I feel... I have a low self-esteem about myself, and isn't Amazon great? I mean, I get on, two days later, it's on my porch. It's only 15 bucks. I mean, no one's going to know. 15 bucks. I mean, you can't even get a burger for 15 bucks anymore, <laughs> right? It's 30 bucks. Well, no one's going to know. He doesn't even look at the credit card, right? She doesn't look at the bank statement. She doesn't know what's that. It's 45 bucks. Then all of a sudden, it's $4,500 in credit card debt. How, how did we get there? Well, we didn't get there because we bought a $4,500 item. We got there because we bought a 15 and a 30 and a 45 and a 50. We didn't say anything. Because no one's going to know. Right? And now all of a sudden, it's a thing, isn't it? it, it, it it's, a, it's a problem. And it's, it's a secret addiction. N no one knows. I mean, I still go to work. Right? It's not a problem. Besides, I hide it in my cupboard in the garage behind the paint can. She doesn't even know where the paint's at. So I just put it like right behind there, and then I just cruise into the garage, kind of look around, I do my thing, and I come in. It's no big deal. The, the, the problem is, is that sin is progressive, isn't it? When, when, when it's a sip here, it's a glass, it's a bottle, it's two bottles, right? When, when, it's, when it's a glimpse on the internet, right? Besides, all guys look. What's the big deal? It's not actually like I'm doing anything. Then it isn't enough, right? Bec because sin is appealing. Because if it was not appealing, we wouldn't do it. Right? I, I mean, I joked about the dentist the other day. I, if you have a root canal without any numbing, you're not going to sign up for it. Like if the doctor comes in and he goes, hey, man, you got to get two molars in the back, two root canals. Problem is I don't have anything to numb your mouth. You game? You're like, <laughs> no. Get this stuff and I'll come in. Right? So sin always looks appealing. It's not like someone just slugged you in the face because you wouldn't do it. So sin always looks inviting, but it's progressive. And it will continue to grow and continue to grow. And then we come back and we rationalize and we justify. Everyone does it. What's the big deal? Even we put it under spiritual air quotes. It's like, you know, I wonder, remember so-and-so from high school? It was like 10th grade. I remember going, oh, she had such cute hair. She's so nice. I'm going to get on Facebook. I'm going to see what she's doing. Besides, I need to know what she's doing so I could pray for her. By the way, I went to high school with my wife, okay? So, <laughs> so I, oh, oh, she's single. Hmm. Oh, look, she hasn't changed. Oh, she's so cute. I remember 10th grade when I was 27. <laughs> I was old for my age, right? Right? Who's going to know? And this is how it starts. It starts out as a little thing, and then it ends up a big thing. 
And when the big thing happens, it's when everyone hears, but the reality is it was a bunch of little steps that took us to there. Yeah. Amen? Number four in your outline, and we'll wrap up here. The fourth one is, is there, the fourth lie is that there is no hope for my marriage, right? So I could change them 50-50, it's not a big deal. And then the last one is, is that there, there is no hope. And I, I just firmly believe that when two people, regardless of the hurt, regardless of the betrayal, regardless of whatever has taken place, when two people are committed to Christ and committed to each other, God can bring restoration. When you think about Jesus, Jesus was sent to this earth to a bunch of people who betrayed him, who turned their back on him, and his desire was to bring reconciliation, right? And so as believers, our goal is always reconciliation. And I just believe that, that God can do a, a miraculous thing. So Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, <clears throat> God looked at them, uh, uh, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, uh, uh, with man uh, this is impossible but with God, all things are possible, right? And, and so I just believe that with God, all things are possible when we're willing to take that initial step. And again, this is where we get into the 50-50 thing because you might be sitting there and you're like, Pastor Dan, I wish my spouse was here, which is part of the problem. You need to change them. Stop doing it. Work on you, right? Change your heart. Let God change them. You do your part. Let God do his part. Right. And so we have to be willing to take out to take that step of, of trust in him and believe him and believe to see what what he's going to do. Ultimately, the devil is a liar, but we know that the truth of Jesus Christ will set us free. And I think it's important that we you know, that we have that context in our life. So we just pause when you think about your marriage or you think about your, you know, your kid's marriage or whatever the season of life that you're in. Are any of those lies true? Because if they're true in your marriage, it's not going to lead to a place that you want to be. It's going to end in disaster. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather today. And I pray, Father, for the services and those who have been watching online and those who are going to be watching throughout the week as well, Lord. That you will bring restoration and healing. Lord, we know that you are a God of restoration and a God of healing. And I just pray, Father, for the marriages for the, for the fiancés and, and so forth that are all here, God, that you will bring healing into their lives. And, Father, that you would reveal areas that they need, that I need to change. Not our spouse, but where I need to change. And, Father, I pray that your spirit would work mightily in our hearts. And, Lord, may we shoot and have a desire for having marriages that are focused on Christ. And, Lord, we recognize that you are awesome, you are amazing, you are the inventor of marriage. And Lord, may we do it as you instruct us to. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So God bless you. Make some adjustments and walk with Jesus. We'll see you on the way out. If you're, by the way, yeah, if you're interested in prayer, 201. What an incredible experience. Remember, we go live every weekend, so be sure to hit subscribe on our channel so you can be notified whenever we upload new content. I also want to invite you to join us for an in-person service when you get a chance. Joining us for one of our in-person services is a great way to meet and interact with new people in our Laurel Ridge family. You can find out more about Laurel Ridge and activities for your whole family by visiting our website. And we can't wait to see you next time. Until then, have a great week and remember, God loves you.